is going on, Pastor Kyle and First Lady has some very formal attire on today, more like a black tie attire. I think you all can probably agree. Uh, but as you all know, we are in a wonderful message series, and it's called Hashtag Goals Love Phonics. If you've been enjoying this thing so far, can you show God your appreciation and love? You may have this piece in the presence of the Lord. We're dressed up today because today's message is entitled... Uh, it is entitled, After the Honeymoon, The Laws of Marriage. And uh, before we get into the message today, we just kind of want to share our memories. As you all probably know, this is my beautiful bride. Uh, she is not a stranger to me. Yeah. Just say, okay, okay I, I didn't call a, a wonderful uh, bridal company and say, send your best model to uh, come and stand by my side. This is somebody that I do know for 12 years plus, uh, married for 12 years. Um, uh, have uh, courted uh, for about a year and a half, and it has been a wonderful experience. And uh, she's going to share uh, a wonderful memory from our wedding, the day of our wedding, which was September 28, 2007. All right, and uh, she's going to take it first, and then I'll share my memories after that. Your first lady, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. I remember our wedding day being like a fairy tale, a fairy tale come true. In precisely, I was thankful to have the exact reception location. I wanted the dress, and I got that dress. I wanted the exact vehicle, I got the vehicle. I guess I felt like a princess. And that was thanks to my grandparents, my godparents, and my mom and dad. Let's, see, let's face it, everyone wants to be a princess, right? Amen? Everybody wants to be a princess. And I can truly say that happened for me. One memory that I would like to share is when my grandpa arrives from the airport. I asked my grandpa, mi abuelo, to be part of my wedding and to walk me halfway down the aisle. I was so happy that he made it on time from Florida because at first he didn't know if he could make it. My grandpa, mi abuelo, from Puerto Rico had, well, my abuela had already told me she wasn't able to come. And it hurt my heart because I really wanted her there. But my abuelo came through. And that was a miracle to see him come on that special day that was big for me and my family. So during the time that my grandpa was there, he kept asking me, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? And I said, si, sí, abuelo, yes, abuelo, I want to do this. He says, are you sure? Tu estas seguro, porque si no, we'll leave right now. And I was like, no, abuelo. And this was literally while we're going to the door <laughs> to enter in. So literally, a lot of people were like, wow, she's so smiling. But they had no idea. My grandfather was in my ear the whole time. Like, we can go now. We can go now. We can go now. So that memory stuck with me for eternity. Then there's a second memory. This memory was very sentimental because we were outside of Villa Lombardi where we had our reception. And I remember leaving my bouquet. And I said, oh, my God, I left my bouquet for the pictures. So my photographer went back inside, and she went to get my bouquet. So Pastor Kyle and I had a moment all by ourselves. And we just said, oh my God, it happened, we did it. We're married, we're indebted to one another. That moment, what, like everything went so fast. Those of you that have been married, you had your wedding, everything goes really fast. But that moment stuck with me because it really told me like, yes, I'm marrying a man that I said yes to and this is forever, eternity. And that moment just, Literally, I started crying, and I was like, I don't want my makeup to get uh, messed up because she was coming back out for photography, but it just made me realize, like, wow, I'm going into another journey of life. So those were my two memories that stuck with me. So I have uh, three memories, actually. Um, my first fondest memory was actually in preparation of getting ready for the big day. <clears throat> we, uh, our wedding was around about 11 a.m., and so I had a really good block of hours. Now, anybody that knows Watkins, we love to sleep. Yes. And so it was very hard for me to even be on time for my wedding, let alone be there. But <laughs> uh, it, it, was a, it was an incredible uh, morning. Uh, as I was getting ready, um, preparing myself, I'll never forget. This is the time, obviously, I was living with mom. And uh, the children are dismissed, by the way. If the children are here, God bless you. We love you. Sorry for that. Uh, we just wanted to really get out here. But can we put our hands together for our teachers who are taking out time to train and instruct your children. Bless your children, bless your children. All right, so um, basically on that day of preparation, I'm, I'm getting ready and I'm just like literally in my, in my undergarments, in my room, and I'll never forget my sister Dawn. Uh, she comes into the room 
while I'm just about to put my tuxedo on and she's crying and weeping and she falls into my arms and she's like, you're leaving us, you're leaving us. And I, I'll just never forget that moment. It was like, this is the realest thing. I am actually leaving my home. Uh, but that wasn't the most interesting part about it. The most interesting part about it was when my mother's coworker came in after my sister. Um, True story, true story, I, I promise you. She comes in after my sister and she falls into my arms and she's like, you're leaving us. I was like, hold on now, wait a minute. You're not family, you can't come in like that. <laughs> you know, it's one thing, it's my sister, but uh, my mom's coworker comes into my room, barges in, so I, I, I'll never, that scarred me for life to this moment. Please pray for me in Jesus' name. It was very weird. The second most fondest moment was when uh, my mom was walking me down the aisle. We did something a little bit different for our wedding. Uh, where actually the groom was walked down the aisle before the bride. Um, and as my mom was walking me down the aisle, uh, I'll never forget when she, uh, when we met, uh, when we, when she walked me down to the altar, she turned to me um, and my mom, it almost seemed like she wanted to kiss me on my lips. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't really sure what was going on here. I was like, mom, listen, I know I'm a mama's boy, but sheesh, just take it easy. <laughs> you know, save this, save, save this for Rachel. This is her job, mom. <laughs> So, um, you know, so that was, that was a very fond moment. I love my mom. My mother's right here. I love you, mom. You're amazing. And then my most third fondest moment, believe it or not, uh, was when all of the friends and family who actually weren't invited to the wedding actually decided to show up. Um, that was a very exciting moment for me because, uh, you know, we didn't have enough plates for them nor enough room. Uh, so they were just eating off to the side. And uh, by the way, they did bring their own alcoholic beverages as well. So it was a very exciting moment. So those are my three fondest moments. Uh, all the married folks in the house say, oh yeah. oh, yeah. All right. Okay, awesome. So then, again, today's message is entitled, After the Honeymoon, because we want to talk about how to keep the vibrance and how to keep your marriage zesty and sexy, come on, somebody, and godly and servant uh, 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 full. It's very important for those of you who aren't married, we pray that uh, these introductions and these messages would inspire you to get married, but just know that God has that one for you. Can you say amen, church? Amen. All right, First Lady is going to read the text today. According to Genesis, oh, let's stand. The custom of our church, amen. According to Genesis 2:18, 20 through 25, the scripture says, The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse 20 says, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the ribs. Everybody say, woman. Woman. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Aye, aye. She shall be called woman, for she has taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Let's pray. Father God, I just ask you, we ask you that you would add an increase to this message, Lord, as I share this pulpit with my wife, my bride, my other half, my better half. Father, I thank you for her. Thank you for her diligence and her hard work, Father, to the ministry first and foremost. Truly, I have found a wife, found good thing, obtained favor from you, O oh God. So I bless you, O oh Lord, and I pray that every husband in this room, as I pray from the male perspective, the husband perspective, would feel blessed as much as I am, if not even more, Father God. In their own way, in their own unique way, in their own individual way, may they, may they find and see the favor of the Lord, hallelujah, in their lives, on their lives, your favor through their lives as a result of their wife. And Father, vice versa, the wife towards her husband. Bless this message, Father, with an anointing of transformation, not just inspiration, not just information, but most of all, revelation. And may that be what transforms us. Thank you, O oh God, once again for this moment. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Come on, can you put your hands together for Jesus and you may have your seats. So my wonderful Brian took out some time and I want to ask if you are married here today, uh, if you perhaps have some notes or a, um, a tablet of some sort where you can take some copious notes today because um, I believe it's going to bless you. 
Is that all right? Can you say amen? The first law of marriage biblically is found in Genesis 2.24 when it says, a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Everybody say one flesh. One flesh. So the first law of marriage today is called priority. Everybody say priority. Again, that word is priority. First and foremost, before our marriage, before our marriage with my spouse, my first priority, you have to understand, Jesus makes it clear, your first priority before getting married is your parents. I, I know that's really hard for you to kind of like really absorb for a moment, but believe me, this is Bible. Your first priority before your spouse is your parents. Honoring and obeying your mother and your father, according to Ephesians 5, it gives us a thorough picture of what a Christian household looks like. But the biblical law of priority, listen to me, in honoring and obeying your parents should always supersede preference. How many of you agree to that? Meaning, since Jesus is my first priority in my relationship with Jesus, it is a direct relation to how I have relationship with others. We are obligated biblically to remain steadfast in honoring our parents regardless, listen to this, if they're saved, if they're unsaved, if you agree with them, if you disagree with them, if they're a sinner or a saint, when we prioritize our parents by honoring them, here's what I want you to understand. What you are doing is you are allowing God and the Lord Jesus to be reverenced through your ways, through your behaviors, and through your thoughts, your patterns, and your perspectives by doing exactly what the Word of God says according to Exodus 20 and 12. And here's what it says. It says, honor, you've seen this before and truly you've heard this. It says, honor, what? Your mother and your father, or your father and your mother, so that your days may be long. Now, in this particular context, I want to share this with you as I teach this, that the word honor in this context, it means to prioritize. Everybody say prioritize. Now, notice I did not say, I did not say uh, idolize. I said prioritize. I did not say idolize. You didn't hear me say demoralize. You did not hear me say criticize. Since we often have a hard time with understanding that word priority, especially as Americans in this westernized culture, please allow me to clarify to you what priority means. Priority means I choose you first. That's what priority means. Priority means I choose you first. It doesn't mean you come before the Lord. It means you are a direct second after my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And before you become married, here's what I'm here to tell you. You are to prioritize, to honor, and to obey your parents. And in doing so, you directly obey and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Does everybody believe that in this room? Okay, so by prioritizing our parents, this is what it means. It means our preferences are always, are always, I'll say it again, your preferences when it comes to prioritizing your parents are always second place to how God requires us to honor our parents who are always first place. Your preferences come in second place. God's priority comes in first place. Now, this directly relates to individuals in this room who perhaps aren't married yet. When you honor your parents, when you obey your parents, you are bringing a glory and a, and a praise unto the name of Jesus Christ. Does everybody believe that? Now, even in spite of being married, once you become married, that does not mean you no longer prioritize. It just means your priorities have been put in a different set of order. What God expects comes first. What I desire comes second. Can we say that together? What God expects comes first. What I desire comes second. But my parents, here's what I want you to understand. They cannot always remain a priority forever. How many of you understand that? Come on. We have got to get real good at understanding this, especially for those of you who are married. My parents are always important. My parents are always honored and they're sincerely loved. But my parents are not forever a priority over my life. Here's why. Because Genesis 2.24 shows us our second law of marriage, and that is the law of transference. Come on, everybody says transference. Once you become married, your priority for your parents is no longer towards them. It is now transferred to your spouse. And here's where my beautiful bride comes in. Transference. As I had mentioned before, on the day of my wedding, my grandfather walked me halfway down the aisle. Why, you asked? because I believed it was powerful for a man and a woman to come together and do life for one another. This example was through my mom, Ada, and my dad, David Young, who created three children, Rachel, David, and Elijah. On my wedding day, I wanted my grandpa to be 
the representation of the lineage and our history of our family tree on my mom's side. I didn't have my dad's father present because he had passed away before I got married. However, it was an honor and a privilege to have the authoritative male figure on my mom's side of the family, which was my abuelo. I love you, abuelo. I know you're watching. My grandpa, mi abuelo, with nervous hands, he walked me down to my parents that waited in the middle of the aisle. Then my parents proceeded to walk me to my husband, and then history began with the Watkins. This example established the significance of the guidance and protection being released by my grandfather to my mother, onto my mom and dad, and then lastly to my husband. Now after holy matrimony, my husband became first and no longer my parents. And this, my friends, is where the transference occurs. The Bible says in Genesis 2:24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now listen, leaving does not mean to disown your parents. It means that your wife or husband now has a higher place in your life, and you must put them in that place so they can work to keep you. It also says that you do not have to quit when things are not going right. Rather, you work as a team to make things get better. Amen. This applies to a Christian household and a non-Christian household. Don't get it twisted. It should not be governed only if your parents are saved or not. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy life on the earth. This scripture also exemplifies a commandment given by God. Nowhere do we find in the commandment, honor your father and mother if they are saved. Amen? Therefore, it is very important that when we're seeking a man or a woman in marriage, that we receive the blessings of our parents, guardians, or pastor if no parent is present. By honoring our parents, we bring honor to the Lord and we show humility and reverence to his word. When transparent is done the right way, it leaves no open doors, no open doors of confusion, and it allows you to be accountable to your actions, your vows, and future commitments. Awesome. What, wasn't that awesome? Thank you so much. Everybody say law number two, transference. Law number one, priority. So the order is number one, priority. Everybody say priority. priority. Then after priority comes transference. I want you to just imagine for a moment the day you got married, Brad, perhaps this is the way it worked for you, Brother Combs, perhaps for you, uh, Gina. When you walk down the aisle, I'm talking about the bride, the bride was escorted by her mother and father, perhaps first lady initially, her grandfather, then the transference was placed on the parents. Kind of makes sense there. But after that transference from the parents, who is it given to? It's given to the groom. Everybody say the groom. That, that law, that authority, that, that command, that power is given over to the groom. Where the parents are no longer the covering of the bride. The groom becomes the covering of the bride. Does that make sense? And so that's where transference comes in. But now we're on to law number three. Everybody say law number three. Law number three, law number three is choice. Everybody say choice. choice. Choice means when we become married, it is me saying, I choose you as my first priority. Unlike our parents who we don't get to choose. How many of you know that? And for some of us, it's very hard for us to take that in. You don't get to choose your parents. You don't get to choose your family. How many of you understand this? You do get a part in choosing your spouse. Maritally, yes. When it comes to the selection of our spouse, the Bible gave the terms and conditions. Prayer proves the dependence and the humility, but we make the choice and decision. God never, listen to me clearly, oh Lord, God never forces you to marry someone. But God always has the right someone for you. I will say that again. God never forces you to marry someone, but he always has the right someone for you. Since Jesus is your first priority, choosing a spouse who is saved should equally be as a priority as well. And the people of the Lord said amen. 
Your devotion to Jesus Christ means that you choose to obey the scripture that says, be not unequally yoked. Come on, somebody. There's nothing more harder than trying your best to serve the Lord Jesus and having a spouse that does not want to do it with you. Come on. So you have a choice in the matter, and that is where you begin to do life with someone and begin to uh, court someone and have fellowship and friendship with this individual. So it gives you an opportunity to, to take notion to the hints and clues of who this individual is and where they stand concerning their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know if I have anybody in here that can agree with me, but I am so glad I have a spouse who loves the Lord Jesus. I am so glad that I have someone by my side who I don't have to pull and pry and beg and grovel at her feet just to go to church. I am so glad that this woman loved Jesus before she ever began to love me. Come on, somebody. And I know unequivocally as a result of watching her behaviors, watching her actions, watching her uh, uh, dispositions and all that that makes who she is, I know unequivocally that at the end of the, of the day, she loves Jesus more than she will ever love me. And that's the type of, I don't know if, I, I don't know, there's nothing more, excuse me, more sexier than a woman who, who, who is by my side who loves to worship the Lord, who loves to cry out to Jesus. Who, who, when I wake up in the morning, I, I interrupt her relationship and her conversation with Jesus. That is a powerful thing. Come on, men. So the fourth law of servitude is, uh, excuse me, the fourth law of marriage is servitude. Everybody say servitude. servitude. Now, there's a scripture in Luke 22 and 24 where the uh, disciples say, who is the greatest disciple among us? They ask Jesus this question. Everybody remember this? And, and Jesus' response to them was simply, I'm the servant. I'm the servant among you. In, in other words, uh, uh, the, the greatest resemblance of the character of Christ is a servant character. Go ahead. Servitude. I just have to use my mom for this. Ma, do you love Jesus? <laughs> she always sings that song with me. I know you guys saw it on YouTube so many times. I think that was a couple years ago, right? I love Jesus. That little girl was so cute. Servitude begins the more we fall in love with Jesus because he is the example of what a servant represents. When I became born again, my old selfish nature Talk changes into a new servant nature. I'm gonna say it again, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. When I become born again, my old selfish nature changes into a new servant nature. Amen? Amen. That happens through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit regenerates me that just, I don't know, that did something to me, Ashley. Go ahead. The Holy Spirit regenerates me to behave and act like Christ. So when I'm regenerating, I'm acting like Christ, Mikey, then I can't be myself anymore. A new nature takes upon me. All old things, brother Andre, is gone. It disappeared. It doesn't exist anymore. So regeneration has to take form in you when you become born again. Amen? Sorry about that, but that just hit me a little bit. How does Christ act? It says in Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, yeah. but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm going to say it again, Brother Mike. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In marriage, we are, Brother Brad, the example of servanthood to one another. For this reason, we must eagerly, eagerly, Brother Marvin, work on pursuing our spouses. <laughs> the example is when we pursue God. When we're pursuing God, we're showing that example of how we need to be with one another. Even if you're not married, with just the next person that's next to you, amen? When you pursue God, you are working extra hard to get close to him and closer to his presence, my God. This is why we should be, this is the way we should be in our marriages. Pursuing earnestly to get closer to our mate, to understand them and to fulfill their needs as they fulfill ours. And I said, as they fulfill ours, we get it construed a little bit because we feel I'm going to, you know, take care of your needs, but oh, you don't really have to take care of mine, but that's not true. That right there becomes a marriage that is in failure. Amen. So God has designed marriage this way. In Ephesians 4, 2 to 3, it says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bonds of peace. Hmm. Let's look a little bit further into bearing. Bearing means, pastor, relation and relevance. Relevance is a state of being closely connected. So when we look at our relationships, we must refer to Ephesians 4 and understand that when God speaks on bearing with one another in love, this is what marriage consists of. The strength of the relationship is pending on the time spent and the effort given to understand and build on the relationship. I'm going to say it again. The relationship depends on the strength of the relationship. It's pending on the time spent and the effort given to understand and build on the relationship. If I as a spouse am not putting any effort to the healthiness of this relationship by connecting to my spouse the way I used to when we were courting, for example, continually getting to know what makes my husband happy, what he likes, what he dislikes, then I am feeling fulfilling the marriage. But if I'm not doing it, I'm not fulfilling it. And why would I not want to fulfill something that God has given me? Because this person is attached to me, right? When you get married, we become one. So if I don't want to hurt myself, why am I trying to, you hear me? Why am I trying to hurt him? What we do is, and I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, but what we do is we become uh, comfortable in the environment that we in, and we feel like, well, you, you're just going to have to deal with it. You know, I'm going through something right now. That's no. your problem. Right, that's your problem, right? You say, that's your problem. No, it's our problem, because together we got to make this thing work, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So before you get married, young folks in here, or you single in the house, say, yeah. All right. Single and ready to single mingle. Women, find yourself a good person that loves to pray, that loves God. You should be clapping a little harder than that. Because things are going to come, trials are going to come, issues are going to come. It's not all peachy and creamy when you first, oh, you're so sweet. Oh, you look so nice. Things change. I was talking to someone, I'm sorry, Pastor, but I was talking to someone the other day, and we're talking to marriage, and I said, I was even talking to my brother, Michael, and I said, you know what, a lot of times what we do is we get things uh, in our mind that, okay, well, we've been married for four years, five years, six years, everything's the same. No, it changes. You have children. Marriage changed. Someone dies in a family, marriage changed. Finances changes, everything changes. And as it changes, you have to go back and look for that manual of what made you in love with that person in the first place. Amen? You have to create memorable moments, time spent to win one another and over and ultimately to make each other happy. You want to show the person that this is how life can be, full of love and wonderful adventures together, even the heartaches. So why do we change? Simply said, we get comfortable. I mentioned that before. We get comfortable. Comfortable with the person being around. Comfortable that the person will never go anywhere. Comfortable that we just understand the changes that may be going on in their life, your life, because you, my dear, have done the amazing job of capturing their hearts. But what about the continuation, Come on. Sister Karma, of happiness? What about that continuation? And the power to keep the relationship alive and healthy. Amen? What about that? For this reason, when we say, I do, we must understand, Marcia, that when I say I do, I mean I do life with you forever. <laughs> it means that at no point can we determine our length of doing life together to make excuses for a delayed behavior and negligence to each other's needs. That's so good. That's so good. There, there, yeah. The picture that you're looking at right now I just took me back a little bit because that's when I actually had a hairline. Um, <laughs> where'd it go? Mm. You know, someone once told me, Pastor, if the scripture says in uh, Matthew that even the very hairs on your head he has numbered, does that mean that God knows you? What I usually say as a rebuttal is that, you know, God made people with perfect heads. Then for those who he didn't, he gave hair to. So... That's for you, Andre. Take that. There's a word in uh, there's a Hebrew word in the Bible, and it's debak. Everybody say debak. And debak, when it when it when it says debak, there's a Q at the end of it, and usually in in Jewish uh, language, it sounds it sounds like that, like 
you know, like you're clearing your throat, um, you know, so it's the Bach. And uh, when, when any, any time you use that, that extra little oomph to that cue, it is the life breath of God that is breathed in your direction. So when we say debak, here's, here's where this is all going to make sense. Debak means to keep close. Debak means to follow closely. It means to cling to. And what's giving you the ability to follow closely, what's giving you the ability to cling to, what, what's giving you the ability to keep close is the, the life-giving breath of Jesus. That's what gives you the strength to do that. You don't have the strength to do that in and of yourself. Does everybody understand what I'm saying to you? And this is why we say that your marriage is a direct reflection on your relationship and your understanding of who Jesus is. It is very hard for you to hold a grudge against your spouse if you've experienced forgiveness. It is very hard for you to hold uh, someone to a lower regard when you've experienced redemption. It is very hard to uh, say that someone will never be better if you have been actually justified by faith and through grace. Because, because your relationship with Jesus and your theological understanding of what the Bible says concerning you means that you have a better way of looking at your spouse even when they don't treat you the way that you'd like them to. Everybody say debak. It's the life-giving breath of Jesus Christ. And without being born again, I can, un I can understand and imagine why it's hard for unsaved individuals to do life together with an individual whom the Lord has joined them to. You can't do a physical thing without a spiritual understanding. Marriage is a spiritual understanding. How many of you understand? Marriage is a spiritual institution. You, you get to physically manifest it, and there are many benefits that come with that. But you have to understand what's keeping you congealed and sealed to this individual is the spiritual bond, first and foremost, between you and God. And as a result of your relationship with Christ, it's easy. It's easy for you to manifest this wonderful relationship that you have with Christ. Christ, the redeemer of all man's sins. Christ, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When you do wrong, he still loves you. This is why the Bible often uses marriage in, this, in the context of Bible when it says that God is married to the backslider. Now, if he's married to the backslider who says, I want nothing to do with you at this moment, how much more can you show mercy, continual mercy, to your spouse who's not treating you right? And the people of the Lord clap their hands and said, amen. So the word cling doesn't mean clink. I'm going to say that again. The word cling <laughs> doesn't mean clink. And when I say clink, I mean as in a ball and chain as someone would consider marriage. You've heard people say, man, I'm not getting married because I, I don't want to be tied down. I don't want to be held back. I want to be single and ready to mingle. I want to have fun. I want to do what I want to do. Come on. Uh, 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 the, the freaks come out at night, and that's when I come out. <laughs> but if I'm married, I can't go out at night. Come on, somebody. Talk back to me. And there's some people that say I'm never going to get married because then my sex life just drops. There's grown folks in this room. There are individuals that see marriage, I'm going to say it again, as a clink, not a cling. This means you cannot stop working, however, because to cling to someone means that I choose you. I choose to serve you for the rest of my life, no matter what the cost. That means I can't stop working towards my marriage. And this leads me, segues us right into the law of marriage number five, and that's called energy. Everybody say energy. Now, I'm not talking about chakras. I'm not talking about stones. I'm not talking about yoga. I'm not talking about uh, 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 power balls. I'm not talking about, uh, the, you know, the universe and the ohms. I'm not talking about the feng shui's and the uh, wonderful aroma essence. What I'm talking about is energy, the, the, the amount of work that you're willing to put into your marriage. Energy means that my marriage is only as healthy as my work ethic. Come on, church. See, here's what you need to understand. Marriage works, but it only works when you're willing to work at it. <laughs> the only reason why marriage is stopped working is when two people take each other for granted and they choose no longer to work at their marriage. It's energy, not chemistry, that's helping your marriage to thrive. Come on, somebody. I'll say it again. It's energy, not chemistry, that's causing your marriage to thrive. What does that mean? What that means is that here's what energy means. Y'all ready for this? Come on. You can write this down if you want. Energy means my, I'm married to my spouse because I fell in love with working on our relationship together. Simple. Simple. I'll say it again. Energy means I married this woman because I fell in love with working on our relationship together. That's what energy meant. 
Now, here's the thing I want you to bring into perspective for those of you who are married, because really I really want to minister to you today. For those of you who are married, I want you to think back to the moments that you were just friends. Think about how much energy you put into your friendship. And then when you start courting, think about how much energy you put into your courtship. You were an excellent servant. Think about that for just a moment. You put so much energy to pleasing that individual. And the reason why you did that was not so much to make them happy. It was to win them over out of all the many variables that could have. So what, the, you, what you did was you worked hard at winning over her interests or her, his interests. Does that make sense? Everybody say energy. Now, here's what chemistry means. Can I give the other side of it? You want energy. You don't want chemistry. Everybody raise your hand and say, I, I want, want energy, energy, not, not chemistry. chemistry. Now, here's the definition of chemistry so that you can get a full understanding. Chemistry means I regret marrying my spouse because she no longer makes me happy anymore. That's chemistry. You see the difference between the two? Do you see the language between the two? Do you sense the lack of energy between the two? This is what chemistry means. And here's a quick disclaimer. And now I want to speak to those of you who are pursuing significant relationships. What's the best way of knowing that you're pursuing a relationship incorrectly? The pursuit of chemistry. It's called the six break this law of marriage. If you find yourself uh, seeking chemistry. Again, it's called the six Break this law of marriage. See, here's what I want to share with some of you who aren't married yet. You need to start breaking strongholds before you even enter into it. Don't wait to get into the marriage, and then it's too late to have to have now clean the stuff up. This is called restorative health. But there's something called preventative health where you, before the man builds a house, the Bible says, he must first, what, count the cost. Come on. And when you seek the Lord with all of your heart and you lean not, come on somebody, into your own understanding, but in all of your ways you acknowledge him, that means before you make a decision, you say, God, are you in this? Come on, can somebody give God praise? Thank you, Jesus. How do you know, Pastor Kyle, though, if you're pursuing chemistry? Can we talk about the chemistry class? Let me bring you into this chemistry class. We're going to go into chem lab real quick. Here, here's what chemistry class looks like in your relationships. He makes me feel good. That's called chemistry. How about this? We vibe together. How about this? We like the same things. Do you know what this equates to? All of this equates to chemistry. Go ahead, baby. Go ahead. Go ahead. Talk to him about that real quick. Talk to him about it. Talk to him about it. So when do you, what do you think when you think of chemistry? You think of beakers, chemicals, periodic tables, gases, formulas. Chemistry wasn't Pastor's favorite. It was mine. <laughs> I loved chemistry. I love the highlight of chemistry. When relationships are based on chemistry, you'll find yourself equating the subroot of all relationships based on the following. Bodily fluid. Oh, Lord. Meaning, I only have chemistry with this person if he or she kisses well or he or she is good in the sack. Yikes. Can I take the second one? Sure. Number two. Can we just say, ooh. ooh. Y'all know that's the truth. <laughs> Very worldly perspective, but no less it is a perspective and it is a pursuit by which people usually seek out relationships. They're using chemistry. I want you to think of a chemistry lab real quick. What do people usually do in chem labs? They experiment. Okay, well, well, hold on. Number two, pheromones. Meaning I only have chemistry with this person if their scent attracts me. Everybody repeat after me. Carnal. 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 Falling in love should never flow, should always flow, excuse me, from the confines of your heart, not the chemistry of your lab. I'll say that again. Uh, falling in love with someone should always flow from the confines of your heart, never the chemistry of your lab. Did you know that the practice of chemistry requires something called test subjects? Meaning your relationships are based upon trial and error with multiple partners. Come on, let me talk about it. Jeez. Did you also know that the practice of chemistry also allows mixing and concocting fluids? Meaning your relationships are based upon mixing what looks like marriage with what's not marriage at all. Y'all ready for this? Premarital sex. Cohabitating. Well, we ain't married, but we got kids together. And it's called chemistry. That is not, listen to me, that is not, one more time, that is not 
the will of God for your life. It's called mixing the truth with a lie. And anytime you mix lie with truth, it's not truth. Hear me when I say this. Love chemists experiment with fake love. Love energists experience real love. I'll say that again. Love chemists experiment with fake love. Love energists experience real love. Anybody want to experience real love in this room? If you want to begin to experience real love, it all begins with the love of the Father. And when you fall in love with the Father as a result of falling in love with what his word said, you want to do what pleases the Father. Why? Because you love him. It hurts the heart of God when you practice, concoct, mix, elixirs, test, trial, error, try to do things your way. Come on, somebody. Amen. The best student in the room, in the classroom of Jesus, is the one that does what he says and doesn't just hear what he says. Come on in the church of God. Everybody say energy. energy. Write it down. Energy is based off of how hard, write it down, how hard I'm willing to serve my spouse even when they're not being a servant to me. Oh. You don't like that, do you? You don't like that. Because, Pastor, I'm willing to put as much energy into the relationship as possible as long as it's reciprocated. But if it's not reciprocated, then what's the purpose? What's the use? Well, let me ask you a question. What was the use for Jesus while you were yet a sinner dying on the cross for your sins? You tell me. Because, because, because the more, I'll say it again, first lady, the more I fall in love with Jesus and what he said, the easier it is for me to show the love of Jesus to a spouse who doesn't serve me. Amen. Am I talking to anybody in this room today? All right. So what fuels servitude in our marriage is not chemistry. We combust and we blow up. And, and it's sloppy and it pours out. And, and we try because some of you are in your chemistry lab and you're stirring. But you're getting real tired, aren't you? You're stirring. But things are blowing up in your face, ain't it? You're stirring. But things are spilling over and it's getting sloppy. You're stirring. But you're getting tired of doing it. And after a while, you, begin, you have to begin to ask yourself the question, when in the world is this thing going to work? It's going to work the moment you step out of that chem lab class. And step into the, into the presence of Jesus and do it his way. Because if you're not doing it his way, there's no other way but your way. But Jesus says, I am the way. Come on, can I get biblical on you? The truth and the life. Amen. No man comes unto the Father but through me. It's Jesus' way. Your marriage, Jesus' way. Your business, Jesus' way. Your audience, Jesus' way. Your financial growth, Jesus' way. Your financial management, Jesus' way. Your mental process, Jesus' way. The way you talk, Jesus' way. The way you walk, Jesus' way. The way you love, Jesus' way. The way you drive, Jesus' way. Everything we do revolves around. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. My energy to serve Rachel fulfills her. Rachel's energy to serve me fulfills my needs. Everything that God put in me is what she needs. Everything God put in her, God put in her. Do you believe it? I said, do you believe it? Because here's what happened. When I got married, I made a, a vow of fidelity. Let me explain. Fidelity meaning I made a promise I will not remove Rachel from the equation of marriage to satisfy my own needs with something else or someone else. Everybody say fidelity. In marriage, we both are at, listen to this, we're both at the mercy of how much energy we're willing to invest in our relationship. Think about that for a moment. Because if you made a vow of fidelity and she's the only one that satisfied my needs, that means you are at her mercy. And, and, and she is at my mercy. 
So if I'm unwilling to invest energy into this relationship, that means that she is bankrupt and bereft, but that does not mean that she is unable to still serve me. Because what she experienced as a result of her vertical relationship with the father is something called unconditional love. That means that she doesn't serve me contingent upon how well I serve her. Because Jesus serves her well, come on, she can continue to serve me. Now, here's the real reason to clap. If we both have the same idea and ideology, no one walks away from the relationship when we get to heaven saying, God, I wasn't served. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Good. So the only reason why marriages fail, can we talk about that? Can we talk about it, y'all? Y'all still here with me? Yeah. Us? Are, uh, yeah? yeah? Okay, one person. The only reason why marriages fail is because of the six break this law of marriage, and it's called selfishness. Oh. Selfishness. Let's think about the words in the word selfishness. Self, fish, nest. <laughs> anytime, listen to me, anytime our relationship doesn't uh, work or it doesn't look as healthy as Christ would like for it to or intended it to, how many of you understand that your marriage, the Lord wants it to look healthy? The Bible says that the Lord honors marriage. Marriage is honorable in the sight of the Lord. It is because our initial servant approach over time deteriorates into three different things. You ready for this? Here it is. The slave master approach, meaning controlling and dominating each other. Number two, the task master approach, meaning too important and too busy to pay attention to each other. The sloth master approach, meaning disinterested and negligent to each other's feelings. Here's my question. Have you ever heard someone ever say, we just fell out of love with each other? You ever hear somebody, come on, by a show of hands, you, you know somebody, we just fell out of love with each other. Even movies, we just, we just fell out of love with e each other. Do you, do you know that I think that is the poorest and sorriest excuse for leaving a relationship that God intended, that God intended, no less, it's very important there, but that God intended to say and use this sorry label on your marriage and say, we just fell out of love with each other. How many of you know in reality that is not the truth? Come on. The real reason for divorce is we stop falling in love with serving each other. And the only reason why I fell out of love with her, biblical translation means that I just got tired of taking on my responsibility of the end of the bargain. I don't want to be a servant no more. That's all you're saying. I don't want to be a servant no more. Man, is this something or what, y'all? Here's my question. What's the best excuse to get married? You should shout it out, anyone? What's the best excuse to get married? Don't want to be, don't want to be lonely, okay. All right. What? Sex, that's right. I've been, listen, I'm burning and I got a, I got a yearning, amen. What? We got kids together. <laughs> Chemistry. I love this. Come on, come on, more, 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 more. Come on, what do you think? Money. money. He got money. <laughs> he old, he stank, right. got no teeth, but he got some money. He could barely move. I'm sitting here feeding him in the morning, in the noonday, and in the supper time. But he got money. <laughs> she makes me feel young again. I'm a sugar daddy. I'm a sugar mama. Come on. Why do people get married? The best, the best excuse to get married is you absolutely love serving each other. And it's done out of unconditional love. That's why we got married. Don't get married for money, honey, bunny, sunny, mommy, daddy, big daddy, little daddy, sugar daddy, sugar mama, baby back, baby back ribs, chilies, Applebee's. Yeah. We going there tonight? That'll be our tip for the word of God. Hallelujah. 
We fell in love with each other. We got married because we fell in love with serving one another. I believe the reason why most marriages start looking less and less healthy after the honeymoon phase. Remember, today's message is after the honeymoon. The reason why they start looking less and less healthy after the honeymoon phase, because we've all gone through the honeymoon phase. Me and my wife, we traveled 11 hours just to experience a honeymoon. It was in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it was amazing. But I'm here to let you know, after that honeymoon ended, it was time to get back to life, back to reality. It was time to get back. And that's when I had to realize, listen, I share this testimony with my wife, and some people don't have this testimony, and that's perfectly fine. This is our testimony. We kept ourselves until marriage. I said we kept ourselves until marriage. And as I said before, if that's not your testimony, that is perfectly fine. You have your own testimony. This is ours. We saved ourselves. And when that time came for, for us to consummate our, well, let me just leave that part out of it. <laughs> because I thought, Andre, that marriage was just about sex. And I had to ask myself a question, and now that, that's a huge part of it, and that's a huge way of showing that you love somebody, but let me, uh, let me explain something to you. You don't get married for sex. You stay unmarried for sex. Think about that. You don't need to get married to somebody to have sex. However, when you love Jesus and you want to do it God's way, I can understand. I can understand how that weighs on you a little bit, but here's what you have to understand. That, 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 that sex is a form of service to your spouse not as a pleasure to yourself. And if you're seeking sex for the wrong decisions, even in the right relationship, you're doing it the wrong way. Here's what I understand. When you have a servant heart, can we be real? Come on, y'all are looking at me. It's all right. Right? When you get married, you please, you're pleased. You find pleasure in being a servant to your spouse. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And if you walk away from that service moment, without ever getting anything, without getting something, you still walk away knowing, I just please my spouse. That pleases the Father. I'm bringing reverential honor to the Lord by being a servant to my spouse. We talked about it last week, did we not? The basin, the water, the towel. How often are you doing that? Here's what I think about marriage, and here's what we're going to say in closing. We have to stop training our spouses to serve us and start training ourselves to serve our spouse. The way I see marriage, real quick, thank you, baby. I love you so much. I love you. You had that dress for so long, and she still fits that thing. That's so good. It even looks better. How many of you know you ain't getting older? You're getting wiser. You're getting wiser. You're getting wiser. Wiser and better. I love you, baby girl. Come on, stand next to me. Stand next to me. Stand close to me. Here's what I want to share with you. Brother Combs would check me on this one because he loves the Bible, and there are several Bible scholars in here and theologians. So this might not be as biblically, theologically sound, Juan, but just bear with me for this. There's, there's a hell marriage and there's a heaven marriage, right? Some of you feel like you're going through hell right now in your marriage. I'm going to, uh, just by this one analogy, I'm believing that God is going to put his grace and anointing on it that's going to pull you out of that hell marriage. And there's some of you that are experienced having marriage, and you're having a great time. Nothing's perfect, but you're, you're good because you married the right individual. You did what God told you to do. You was led by the Holy Spirit. You had a body of people surrounding you, praying for you, holding you accountable. This is very important. Here's what I think heaven marriage looks like. You ready? Heaven marriage looks like a table spread, long and lofty, full of delicious meals it is unimaginable i can only imagine what the meals are going to be like up there and trust me i'm looking forward to it i'll probably be late for the classes and all they'll be like pastor cow where are you at no yeah there ain't no pastor cow cow where you at i'm coming the bible talks about the marriage feast of the lamb you all know that it says it in revelation it talks about it did you know that when we get to heaven, the first thing that Jesus wants to do is serve you? Just think about that for a moment. After the righteous 
seed of Christ, of being judged, not according to your sins, but your works, after you've received your just rewards and Christ divvies them out, he's going to say, all right, y'all ready? Yeah, what's next? We're going to eat. Oh, you best believe I'm going to be the first one on the, at the table. <laughs> VIP section. He wants to serve you. Think about that. After you receive your rewards, crowns of righteousness, crowns of glory, crowns of this, crowns of that, jewels, gems, rubies, diamonds, the first thing that the Lord wants to do is bring you into a room where the table of the Lord is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on and say, sit, let me serve you. Why? Because all along, when you were living this life in marriage down here on earth, it was a direct reflection of your relationship with Christ where you're finally going to get that moment where the bridegroom is going to cover you, bride. You're the bride of Christ, aren't you? You're the church of the living God. And the Bible says the spirit of the Lord God dwells in you. He's going to want to cover his bride. And say, come on. And what's he going to do? He's going to serve you. What I think marriage looks like is we get to sit across the table from our spouses. Again, not as theologically sound because I don't believe marriage is in heaven. This will be my sister. But maybe, entertain the thought. I sit along the table, uh, across the way from the table with her. There's no cell phones. There's no tablets. There's no smartphones distracting your conversation. Think about that. How are you practicing and stewarding what God gave you? You know marriage is not your ownership, it's your stewardship. How are you handling God's holdings? It's not yours. She's not yours. He's not yours. Temporarily, your bodies belong to one another, bone of bone and flesh of flesh. But when you get to heaven, we're going to have glorified bodies. There's no bone of bone and flesh of flesh. There's no cling. There's no clink. There's no debak. We're all perfected bodies at that moment. But you're going to sit across the table from this spouse, maybe. You have long arms. Your arms are so long, you can't feed yourself. Your arms are just long enough, you feed the one sitting across from you. That, to me, is a heaven marriage, where you sit across the way from your spouse and you say, baby, what would you like? Would you like some filet mignon? Would you like, uh, what, how can I serve you? Again, you can't serve yourself. This heaven image, you can't serve yourself. Your arms are too long. They're not short enough to serve yourself. They're just long enough that they can reach across the table and they can serve your spouse. Does this make sense? And you, 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 you exhaust all of your time asking her, asking him, what can I do to serve you? <laughs> How can I best serve you? What do you want now? Potatoes? Uh, yams? What, green beans? What, what do you want? And look, you just, you just keep what? Serving. And look, as you serve her or him, they serve you. That's a heaven marriage. Here's what hell looks like. Hell marriage. Same exact image, same table, same long arms, same food. The only difference is instead of serving each other, your arms are folded and you choose not to serve each other. That's the difference. The question is, is what do you want your marriage to reflect? Heaven or hell? Can we put our hands together and give the Lord some praise? I love you. Come on, stand on here. Come on, stand on your feet as we uh, honor the presence of Jesus. How can I serve you? What can I serve you? Man, I'm telling you, y'all best not. Come on now. I feel like there's about to be babies popping up out of nowhere. Just like some of y'all got your two side. You're going to be like, uh, uh. It's going to bless your marriage that much. And for those of you who aren't married and perhaps uh, you desire to be married, you're going to start making some valuable decisions because one thing you have to understand is <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing to become married. It's a wonderful thing to do the will of God. But are you ready for marriage? That's a whole nother story. Does your life look like the life of marriage? Have you, have you set up the, 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 the auditorium for your bride to be received? The Bible says, may the bride come into the bridegroom's chambers. Do you have a chamber for your bride? For you prospective grooms out there? Do you, do, do, what, what do you have for them? Well, we're going to just, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to vibe together. 
we got things in common. We just gonna we come on, baby. Blow it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna win. Man. You're rolling dice. You need to find counsel. Come on, lift your hands. You need to find counsel. You can't do this on your own. Uh, forget your ideas. If your ideas don't equate to God's plans for your life, they are only ideas. The Bible says many are the thoughts or many are the devices of a man's heart, but it's the goings of the Lord that establishes a man. And it, the steps of a good man are what are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. You can't do marriage without the Lord. This is for some of you who are married. I want to just ask some of you, this is a sacred moment right now. We're about to leave. If you just bear with us for a moment. I want every groom, every man, every husband to just face and turn their wife real quick. Hallelujah. For those of you who want to get married, this is just a very valuable moment for you to just see the, the sacredness of, of marriage, the sanctity of marriage. Come on, grab, grab your groom, your, your bride. Hallelujah. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take, if, if it comes off, because you know those fingers be swelling, you know, you're just like. Slide that, 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 that ring off their finger. If, if your groom isn't here and you're married, if your groom isn't here, you're like, by faith, Pastor, mm, I got it in my hand. Ooh! Some of y'all so lovely, you can be married to yourself. James Brown said, I'm so pretty, I could kiss myself. If you're married, take that ring off your bride's finger and for the bride if it comes off ooh. ouch ouch no one's getting hurt right now it's just the fingers under agony groom take yours off no this is gonna here take mine oh hold on now grooms give your give your rings to your bride and Bride, give your rings to your groom. Do you remember the day? I got married at the age of 22 years old. Very, very young. But one thing I will tell you. My mom will tell you. I had things in order. Me and my wife, when we got married, we came back from our honeymoon. We moved right into our home right into our, uh, our one-bedroom apartment. Good paying, good paying job in a career. Graduated college at that point. My wife had been well established in her job. We had created a, an atmosphere. This is why the courtship process is very important. We're gonna get into courtship and dating, but this is why that process is very important because you don't wanna bring someone you love into your mess. And you have every right to say no when they try to welcome you into theirs. Come on, come on into my bed. Come on. Yeah, come on. Use some discernment. Use some wisdom. And the people of the Lord said amen. God has great plans for your lives for those of you who are unmarried. And we pray that you would find your potential spouse. I believe Brother Paul's in the back right now just interceding on your behalf. Because some of you want to get married so bad. It's like, I want it. What else do I need to do? It's going to happen in God's time. But what are you doing in preparation of this moment? Grooms, I want you to take that ring. And I want you to hold. What, what hand? Oh, Lord Jesus. Left hand. All right, the left hand. Left hand. And I want you to... Uh, Slide that ring halfway on that finger and look your bride in the eyes and say, honey, I love you. I thank God for you. I commit myself to you as your only servant aside from Jesus for the rest of my life. I vow to serve you 
with all my strength, with all my heart, and with all my might. All of me belongs to all of you, and I devote my life to being your best servant. In Jesus' name. Come on, slide that ring. Now take your left hand and give it. Wife, slide that halfway on there. Look at your husband in the eye and say, husband, my covering. I make the vow to serve you for the rest of my life. I understand a wife isn't weaker, smaller. The wife is a vessel that is delicate, like fine china. I'm in your hands. I'm under your protection. I'm under your covering. And I submit to the authority of Jesus first. And because Jesus transferred a spiritual authority to my husband, I say yes. I say amen. I love you in Jesus' name. <laughs> That's jiu-jitsu for him. <laughs> if you love the Lord, can you put your hands together and give Jesus a... Yeah.